But now for something completely different, let me check if my full screen slideshow works. I think it's looking fine on Twitch. So now we're going to get an Italian and a German trying to cook pasta together. It's not the beginning of a joke. Hello, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> you can guess that I'm the Italian and Thomas is the German. And uh, usually, as it came up many times, Germans apparently they break the spaghetti, which is a big, you know, blasphemy for Italians. But that's that's just. But, but you can get it into a smaller pot. In some cases, exactly. We need to break the spaghetti. So in this other motivational, somewhat funny uh, talk, we try to introduce the concept of parallel computing using kitchen as a name. Right, so my task is to cook pasta for four people. And the ingredients, if you want to make it good pasta for four people, is 500 grams of spaghetti. Uh, hopefully, you have a mother from Italy, like I do, and you have some amazing ready made tomato sauce that she made. Four liters of water, even though it would be five liters of water, but you know, we, are, we care about the environment. Four liters of water is not enough, and a bit of salt. And then, of course, we need some tools. We need the stove like we see here, um, stove at multiple burners. You need at least one burner for warming up the, the water. And then uh, you, know, you need the pot to heat the water and the spaghetti tongs to, to steer the spaghetti. So the algorithm, the recipe for doing this is that you boil the water for five minutes, add the salt quickly, and then put the spaghetti in water and let them cook for eight minutes and stir every now. So, you know, for those who missed the joke, the metaphor, sorry, I'm not joke, metaphor that we're talking about here is that the chef, the cook, the person is the process, the computing process, you know, that manages all the various resources. The pot of turning computing is called the thread that, you know, in this case, I have one pot, so I can only run one thread, one computation per time linearly. Uh, serially. Then there's the kitchen, which is the node or, or the computer where, you know, like the, the laptop, for example, where all these components are stored inside. And there's the stove where there's one or more CPUs. If, for example, in laptops, often you have four, four CPUs these days, if not more. Then there's the burner, which is the single CPU. There's some water, which is the memory, and the pasta in this case is the data that we need to process. All right, so now what the main key thing is about time. Making the pasta will take time, and especially specifically for this type of pasta, every pasta has a different amount of time. You should always check it in the envelope. For this type of spaghetti, it will take eight minutes to cook them properly. So now the question is, if my stove in my kitchen has four burners, could I, you know, I make the pasta? in whatever time divided by four minutes, you know, could I parallelize the pasta? And these yellow boxes that you see there in the bottom are the computer examples. So, you know, you go to a cluster that has 40 CPUs on a node, you know, do I just throw, you know, I'm, I'm used with my laptop that has four CPUs, can I just move my code there and suddenly we run 10 times faster? Well, the answer is no. So multiple thoughts at once, well, no parallel. So even if, if we're going to try to, you know, cook the pasta, you know, let's imagine that the task would be that we would need to cook four times the amount of pasta. So then, you know, I would need to have four pots, four packs of, of spaghetti, four tomato sauces. These are things that we can buy. And your laptop already has four burners ready to be used. But me, myself, the process, I don't know how to take care of more than one pot. I never learn how to take care of two pots at the same time. So I'm limited. What, what I can only do is that I can cook one pot of pasta, wait that it's over, repeat, you know. So to cook pasta for four, four times four for 16 people, it will, it will, take, it will take me four times the total amount of pasta. So unless your code specifically knows how to use multiple CPUs, it will not get any faster. But and it's course, actually not yeah. not so easy to um, learn how to uh, use multiple pots at once, um, at least in the on the computational sides, because your code commonly well does not do multi-threading initially. 
but honestly, even in the kitchen, it would be <laughs> unless you're doing completely different tasks that you're, you know, cooking some sauce that maybe you can let rest for a bit and then taking care of the pasta, you're not, if, I don't know if I would actually be able to cook four pots of pasta in Parma. But let's assume that I go to cooking, Parma cooking school, and I learn this new technique, which is the open MP, uh, which in this case is open multipot, that in uh, real life open MP is the language, is the API, whatever, it's the system that is used to basically have multiple process running. So now I can cook pasta for, I can put four pots of pasta in parallel because now I learned this, which means I've rewritten my code that you can actually see the four CPUs and run four processes independently. We just now have to be, you know, a little bit more careful that our processes don't get into each other way. So, you know, if I'm steering one pot, I should be careful that I don't forget the other pot. So now I can actually cook pasta for 16 people and all in the same, in the tea time, you know, because it's all done in parallel. So in eight minutes, the pasta for 16 people will be ready, thanks to the parallelization. This is quite a trivial, simple parallelization. The four pots of pasta, they don't really need to talk with each other. As long as me, the process, I remember that one started maybe even a few seconds later than the other, it's, um, it's, it, it's quite a simple process to scale. But now things a little bit get, you know, a little bit more complicated. Maybe, you know, I'm not really able to manage the, the four pots in parallel. I could hire, you know, I could hire three more Italians to cook pasta with me. So then the, I need to basically talk with these three other Italians that are, they're sharing the same kitchen. Of course, they talk in the kitchen. I guess you can cue all the cliches. Multi Italians cooking, but uh, what the equivalent in company is the so called messaging, um, not called interface, but the mess. What, is, what, what was MPI? Oh, uh, process uh, interface, I yes, think. messaging process interface. That uh, now suddenly, you know, we need to talk with the other processes. And what is interesting here that, um, you know, when we, if we really want to scale things up, they don't even need to be in the same kitchen. They can actually be in the kitchen upstairs, in some other kitchen, in the in the in the same building. And we could just pass these messages and like, okay, now it's time to throw the pasta. And everyone can throw the pasta at the same time. So by adding more processes, more people, we can actually, you know, get more things done once again. But things in general don't really scare linearly. It's not that by hiring 1,000 chefs, I will still be able to produce in a synchronous way this whatever 1,000 times 500 grams of pasta, because then the messaging, you know, the overhead of the messaging to synchronize with all the 1,000 chefs will be will be quite that you know it will take some of the time of the, of the, some of the cooking time, some of the synchronous time between the different pots. So now, Actually, I think you think about uh, Enrico calling all the different chefs <laughs> and uh, having a short chat. Um. Yeah, like how do we, you know, maybe it's easy if one person broadcasts and messages to many others, but if it has to be interactive and one has to say, hey, my water is not yet boiling, please everyone wait. You know, it's uh, it, it, you know, the overhead of this message passing, it can take a little while. But now let's assume that, you know, I go to a computing cluster, meaning that I live in a building apartment that has 25 apartments. I could actually scale this pasta cooking, you know, 25 times because there's 25 building apartments and each apartment has a stove with four burners. Would my pasta time again be able to scale so that I can cook the pasta in whatever T divided by 100? Well, no, because Cool. Yes, the cluster has, for example, 300 nodes and every node has 40 CPUs, but I can't just throw my code to the cluster and hope that now suddenly everything goes, uses the 300 nodes and whatever 300 times 40 CPUs. It's not going to happen unless I specifically rewrite things to make it happen. So, so for example, you know, this could be the case that I know 
on the remote node, meaning not just my two gen, but someone else's two gen. And I could start running some of the faster wind inside the food chain. So, you know, I will I have a friend upstairs, for example, I know them very well, I give them a call when I use your four burners that you have in your flat. And so yes, I could now run eight eight parallel pots for pasta. But sometimes the kitchen upstairs might be busy. So if I'm requesting for four pots from a friend upstairs, it's actually not that enough. Well, actually, I'm also cooking pasta and the sauce. I only have two, two burners available. So then I go to the housing company manager, which is Sir Lerm. In computing, it's going to be Slurm. You will learn a lot about Slurm in the day two and three. So Slurm, this Sir Lerm knows everything about the kitchen in the building. And I can start asking to Slurm, you know, is there any free kitchen with four burners that I can immediately use? So I might need to wait. Slurm knows that actually the name is upstairs in the last floor, they're soon done. So if you wait 10 minutes, you can then start your um, four burners pasta making, you know. So again, on the cluster, there are so many computers that it would be impossible for you to keep track of them, to know which one is available and which one is not available. So then enters the workload manager, Slur, which basically does this for us. You request the amount of resources you request in this case, one node, one kitchen with four CPUs, with four burners. You will have to wait a little bit if there's none available. And then once you get it, you can start your process with this node that is assigned to you. Then, you know, there are other special things and special tools that the burner family is not made for them. So now let's suppose the case of the cheese grater. The cheese grater is a great example of uh, architecture that is uh, that the hardware is actually as parallelization of the layer. So a cheese grater can cut many things at once, but does it work for any slicing problem? Well, of course not. Here the metaphor is that the cheese grater is a GPU. The GPU is the graphic processing unit which is somewhat similar to the CPU, but the difference is that the architecture, the actual hardware, the actual pieces of wire that are inside there, they're actually built with parallelization in mind, which means that it can work much faster than, than having, you know, 10 CPUs or one of the CPUs in parallel. But of course, the code and the problem needs to be written specifically for GPUs. So for those cost for those friends who want to add cheese on their plate, you might want to use the GPU because if I don't have a GPU, I will need to break the Parmigiano Reggiano to split the knife with a CPU knife. And it will take me ages, you know, to break the block of Parmigiano. But with the cheese grater, with the GPU grater, with a, you know, suddenly I can break the full Parmigiano block and get all the cheese there. So a GPU can do very many things at once, but only a very specialized kind of job. And you need specific programming skills for specific problems to use. And you'll probably need to adapt your cheese a bit to the cheese grater. If you have one of those mill, uh, cheese grating mills, um, you will need to cut the cheese small enough so that it actually fits in there, which is essentially adapting your code to that's a, that's work, on the, work on the GPU. That's an excellent metaphor because actually the block of Parmigiano Reggiano, I don't know if you've ever seen it, they are like wheels really huge wheels, they weigh many, many kilos. There's no way that you can fit them in a small GPU, <laughs> in a small grade. So you need to break the Parmigiano into smaller pieces so that you can actually hold it and break it. And the same is with the, with the GPU and with the kind of speed compatible amount of data that you can take at once. All right, so this was just a little bit funny thing. And uh, you know, I'm sure this metaphor, this joke can will be improved in the years. But in general, there are some five take home messages from this uh, kind of funny introduction to scientific, to parallel computing. Parallelization can speed up your tasks, but not any faster than the smallest serial task. So if the smallest serial task will always take eight minutes, you know, you can't go faster than eight minutes. There's no way that you can make fast faster than that. 
And um, for example, in our case with the pasta, if you load data, um, what's commonly restricting you is actually loading the data from the hard drives. So this can't be speed up. You can boil the water faster potentially initially. That's more CPU power. But the pasta loading, um, that's eight minutes, or in that case, in the example, cooking it is loading the data. That's eight minutes. Um, your hard, hard disk is not faster. It can't provide it faster. Exactly. So it's important then to think of your workflow. Sometimes you, if you feel that your processing is slow, and you need to see, okay, what is the kind of the smallest serial bit in my processing? Because then, if that is the you know the length of the process, then maybe there's nothing that you can do because you know to take a fast to make a fast that will always take eight minutes. But maybe then there are things that can be run in parallel that don't need to depend on on the whole process. And so then you you start understanding where you can apply parallelization and when you can just stick with the linear execution of your code. The second take of message is that the benefit from parallelization comes after modifying your code. So you, you really, you, you can't just take often, very, very often, most of the time, you can't just take your code and move it, you know, to a, to a stove, to a kitchen that has multiple, multiple nodes. So you, you need to not just modify the code and use this uh, multi-thread, multi-processes. You also need to test that it's using this multiple processes. This is also what you will see in day two and three. That there are ways, for example, in the HPC cluster to check what was the performance of my code. Was I really using at full the four CPUs that I requested or the 40 CPUs that I requested? Or was it that in practice I was only using one? And then the point number three is that sometimes we have special hardware that is built for parallelization GPUs. But then once again, it will require us extra effort. And not all the libraries, not all the system automatically will translate your code so that it will use the GPU and work on the GPU. And sometimes it's not enough to just change the code. Sometimes you also need to change the full data loading. Like as I brought there, sometimes you actually need to break the spaghetti that they can fit in the smaller memory that the GPU is part like that. I mean, if, you, as a spaghetti breaker in German, <laughs> if, you, if your GPU only has a limited amount of um, memory, uh, then yeah, well, you need to divide your spaghettis into smaller pieces. Exactly. That's how it is. So then it's also the compromise, which is, which is not a silly compromise. Imagine that I need to process this data only once. Do I really need to spend all my time in re- arranging the data, reloading the data in a different way, rewriting the code for the GPU, or should I just wait for instead of doing it in one day, maybe I wait one week and that's it. And I don't need to do it again. So this type of you know thinking on the resources that you need, this needs to come from you, this needs to come just related to your specific problem. And then the fourth point is that requesting the resources from a big cluster, yes learn, will inevitably require queuing. Sometimes you are happy to request just one stove from one kitchen and very often there is always a CPU that is available and you can start queuing. You, you, you don't need a queue and you need to get to the computer. But sometimes you really have a special cooking system that really requires 40 burners in the same kitchen, 40 CPU in the same mode for whatever reason because you, you know, this is the software that you're using. And then you know, yes, there are those resources, there are those nodes available, but you might need to queue a little bit longer. And then once again, is it better to queue for two days and get something done in 10 minutes, or is it better to queue for one minute and get something done in 24 hours? You know, once again, you it, it you know, this is not that there is no answer to this question, but it it, it requires you know trial and error and understanding what is the computing time, what is the cost you need to do. And finally, sometimes let's always remember that we might not even need parallelization. We might, you know, well, not, not just because we need to do something that is serial, but also that sometimes the effort, as I was just saying, of rewriting everything into parallel doesn't really take 
However, still it's beneficial to move the water on the remote HPC cluster. Because as Simon was saying earlier, I don't need to keep my laptop running for 24 hours if it it's a 24 hour processing job. When there's already a machine in a in a data center that is already switched on, with a, there's already CPUs there, already running idle, waiting for something to do. So it's much more efficient for you, for the environment, to use something that is already on, that is already running, where you can just send your script there. And most likely the data is also there, so you don't need to start you know, moving the data around, forgetting which version of the data is the most recent one. Let the machine, the remote machine, do the computer, and then you can get the output, the results to your local machine and make the pictures, write the paper. And this and you can system. even work on on your computer without it being blocked by oh all the memory is used by my uh, computation job or stuff. So your Chrome can actually suck all the RAM on your laptop while the remote machine is untouched with the full RAM available. So I think we are done with this somewhat funny introduction to parallel company. We are exactly on time. Let's check if there's anything on FND. I can make my we can exit this um, presentation mode. Yeah. There was a no, well, I mean there's um, there were a couple of extra slides that I didn't include, but you can look at them that uh, some people might think, uh, well, you know what, I'm gonna buy a megapot. The megapot, you know, it's like, okay, now I have this megapot, I can make faster for 100 people in just a single pot. Yes, it's true, you can do that. But how many times do you need to make faster for 100 people? So this very expensive hardware is very useful if you rather than buy it just for yourself, if you share it with others, because today you need to make faster for 100 people and tomorrow someone else. And and in general, I think this metaphor can be improved further. So maybe you people who are listening and learn these things right now at the end of the three days, you can think of you know, other metaphors and better metaphors for you to understand and for others to understand that. Better. Yeah. There's a question how do you figure out what form of parallelism a code uses? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if it's uh, if it's analyzing the code. Um, well, you have to essentially look at it. And um, if it's using some libraries, yeah. uh, it's very likely that this is some kind of multi-threading uh, with, within a certain framework. If it's in, inside some more low-level library, if it's um, if you did it, uh, you or the top level of your code does it, then it's very likely that you can see it directly from um, yeah the code the code itself, what kind it's using. But if it's more the question what you should use, uh, and then uh, this depends on the problem. <laughs> there is no answer. Yes, like I would also add that, like if you don't know if you're if you use already existing programs, like like most of us do, like who wants to write something that is available for everybody for free and made by somebody who is usually better at coding than you are. So personally, I I use everything. Uh, like if it's if somebody has already created a tool that is does what I need it to do, I will happily use it because then I don't have to waste my. Uh, time doing it and maybe do, most likely doing it worse than, than the original author. Uh, so if if I, I usually look at at certain key buzzwords like w they were already mentioned like multi-threading, multi-processing, MPI. Like if you see mentions about number of jobs or number of threads or number of workers, it usually means uh, usually means multi threading or multiprocessing and if you see M mpi mentioned somewhere it means mpi mm -hmm. so i usually like uh, look at those passwords if i see if i see gpu mentioned or cuda it usually means that it's gpu uh, or mm -hmm. it, it can utilize gpus so 
uh, just checking those can help you find out whether your program has a possibility of utilizing multi-threading. And so many like, uh, let's say machine learning frameworks, they you often have like some sort of parallelism that you can use to, to do analysis. Uh, just by adding uh, not one parameter somewhere that makes it use multiple processors instead of one. Uh, and about uh, what, which framework is the best? Well, yeah, like Thomas said, you you really cannot tell. Like there's there's so many different uh, problems and so many different ways of solving those problems that you need to pick the one for the mm -hmm. uh, for the situation. I didn't use the word embarrassingly parallel, but it will come up in the future days. Mm -hmm. But in general, something that is embarrassing parallel is like you really need to rerun the same process if you just change one parameter because you want to test if you want to support the parameters like wrong. Or you want to test the script with the one, with the two, with the three. So that's where you should start. If you know that you have a problem that could be split in this, in this embarrassing parallel, mm -hmm workflow then that's the thing. that's where you should think yeah where the parallelization is so so in the also in the analog like if you can add more kitchens with more italians that's like <laughs> It can be. It can feel stupid that you hire more people to cook pasta instead of teaching one person to use multiple uh, pasta pots. But it it produces the same results. They or if it produces the same results, it's it's fine. So like uh, adding more more cooks uh, if the and the if the every cook does the, its own job. If it, if it if it uh, gets the same result, it's it's fine. Like uh, it. It doesn't need to be pretty if it works. Uh, well, yes. the thing, the the parallelism would essentially be uh, there if you have a cook, uh, if you if you can hire cooks on a temporary basis, then that works quite well. If you would actually have to hire them long term, well, or buy new equipment, then um, it gets difficult. But since we can hire people for a certain task. Yeah, it should be fine. Okay. Should we go to our break and then we can keep answering questions in the HackMD even during the break? Sounds like a plan. Okay. Yeah, so keep asking and answering and we will see you back soon. <laughs>